really exciting to be here and talk a little bit about CEDAR, one of the other BD2K centers. Like all the BD2K centers, CEDAR has just gotten <laughs> started in the past few months. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about will be our plans for our future work, so I'm not going to be able to show you too much of what we've actually already accomplished. But our goal is to be able to facilitate science, essentially. We are a center that concerns itself, of course, with big data, but we actually are really worrying about all data because the scientific method requires us to be able to look at one another's data, to be able to replicate experiments, to be able to have a basis by which we can evaluate other people's work in science and to extend that work. And so our work in CEDAR is basically to look at the problems of metadata, the data that explain what data sets are all about in an effort to try to make it more interesting, more valuable, and make, make the data themselves more expressive and more findable. So we have, a, we have a center, we have a logo. I just want to emphasize that our logo is a tree because we're at Stanford and we like evergreen trees. But uh, the, ma the main emphasis here is to deal with the, the fundamental problem that uh, people are becoming increasingly concerned about science, both within the academy and also on the outside. Uh, a couple uh, years ago, The Economist ran this front page story, which got an awful lot of attention, basically in response to what was viewed globally as a, as a crisis in uh, the reproducibility of scientific data and the veracity of scientific results. Uh, around that time, Amgen had published a paper saying that they had looked at 53 of the most seminal studies in cancer biology, tried to replicate them, and only in six cases were they able to replicate the results. And a few months later, Bayer came out with a study saying it tried to replicate some 70-odd uh, seminal scientific studies, and about 25% of the time they were successful, 75% of the time they were not. Uh, there are lots of reasons that, that scientific results may or may not be trustworthy. Obviously, there's um, the problem of fraud. Uh, many of you may have seen the uh, yet another attraction this week in Science Magazine of a very large, well-publicized study where the data were, were patently fra uh, fabricated. So fraud, obviously, is an issue. Uh, there's the whole question of whether studies have adequate power or statistical inference capabilities. We're not going to deal with statistics in our center, but we are concerned about the ability to actually evaluate the data and understand the methodology by which experiments are performed. All of us in science know that our journal articles are more and more limited in their size. The methods section gets, in small, gets to be in smaller and smaller font. And the ability to be able to read an article, to understand what other scientists have done, becomes increasingly difficult. And one of the reasons that that becomes a problem is that there needs to be a representation of actually what was done. And although the article provides one place for that where that occurs, the other place where one can get inf information about what was done is to actually look at metadata. Because most of the time, um, scientists are expected to put their, their data online. The NIH for several years has had requirements for experimental data to be made publicly available. And as we'll talk a little bit later, whether or not those expectations are actually met is a very difficult problem. But when data are posted online, there's an expectation that there will be other machine-readable information that will explain uh, what experiment was performed, uh, who did the experiment, uh, how were the data collected. They will document uh, the policies regarding missing data or other uh, outliers, and basically make it possible by understanding pre precisely what was done, how one can interpret the data, how one can reinterpret the data and learn from the experiments that were performed. And so metadata become very important. The problem that we face in our center is that basically people hate metadata because it's a real difficult challenge to be able to describe metadata, to create them, and frankly, most scientists view their work as doing the experiments, perhaps publishing the results, but annotating the scientific data that are put online is viewed as something which is really not to the advantage of the investigator. It's something to help other people. It's supposed to allow others to reinterpret the data, maybe even scoop the original investigator. And so there's not a lot of motivation to put the data online and to annotate the data accordingly, but frankly, without those metadata, the, the data become uninterpretable. 
We spent a lot of time in the past couple of days talking about genomics. And frankly, in the 1990s, when, when microarray technology became extant, people recognized that you couldn't just publish all this information in the journals. You had to have the data accessible and online. And more important, you had to be able to have the data in a form where people could actually understand what the experiment was. The community got together at the time and created a standard for metadata called Miami, the minimal information about a microarray experiment. And in the Miami standard, there is a list of the things that, micro, that metadata about a microarray experiment should mention. They should explain uh, what the raw data are, what the uh, process data are, what are the experimental factors, who did the experiment, what was the substrate, basically the information that is required in order to make sense of the information that's put online. Miami was actually a major advance because it represented the community coming together, recognizing that the scientific method required the data to be made available, and for the data to be interpretable, there needed to be a minimal set of things one could say about the microarray experiment. And as when Miami became uh, widely popularized, other groups of scientists in biomedicine got together and said, you know, we need to do the same thing. You can go to the MIBI portal. MIBI is the minimal information about biological and biomedical investigations. And MIBI will have a whole list of dozens and dozens of metadata standards. These metadata standards are not standards that are imposed by large organizations. They're basically created by community-oriented efforts where scientists get together and say, look, these are the kinds of things that we need to have in our metadata in order to understand what other investigators have done. And MIBI is a really good example of how the community has come together in a large number of areas where various kinds of biomedical experiments can be described according to these particular standards. MIBI is a piece of the biosharing effort. And so biosharing is, again, an international uh, uh, community of investigators trying to promote uh, these minimal information sets, as well as other kinds of metadata that are important for scientists to be able to share information about their work. I should say that one of the co-investigators of the Cedar Center uh, is Susanna Sansoni at Oxford University, who has been primarily responsible for getting the biosharing initiative going. Biosharing has been great because it really represents, again, the community coming together and trying to improve science by taking advantage of the kinds of metadata that will make uh, their data sets more interpretable. Problem, however, is that the biosharing approach is very limited in what it can do. The emphasis has really been on the development of these checklists. Uh, there's not much consideration of what one needs in order to uh, create values for these checklists. So might, the, the checklist might say that you need to ex ex explain the experimental factors, but if there's no standard way of describing experimental factors, there's no way for a computer to really understand what was done in the investigation. So there's really little consideration of how you come up with the value sets and the ontologies that might be used to describe those value sets. And frankly, what we need are more computationally friendly ways of representing information about experiments so they can become useful to uh, the scientific community. Our collaborators in the Human Immunology Project Consortium represent a large group of, of investigators in the United States who actually understand metadata and have religion about metadata. What's happening in HIPSI is the idea that metadata should not just be checklists, but they should actually be computer understandable representations that describe the data sets in a lot of detail. And my collaborators at Yale who, are, who chair the HIPSI uh, standards working group, uh, Kay Chung and Steve Kleinstein, are working really hard to come up with computer represented, rep representable metadata standards that are being used throughout the HIPSI uh, community. HIPSI is taking its experimental uh, information and putting it into a repository that has been created th uh, through the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases called IMPORT. And IMPORT is the place to go to find basically all the information you might want, data and metadata, that are being provided uh, as a consequence of, of, of uh, investigations funded by NIAID. And my co-investigator, Jeff Weiser at North, Northrop Grumman, is responsible for the import uh, uh, resource, which, which stores the data and the metadata. And so in CEDAR, basically, we have the opportunity of having an entire ecosystem dealing with data and metadata that provides a sandbox where our center is going to initially be exploring how we're going to be managing metadata and exploring new technologies for making metadata more expressive and more, more useful. <laughs> 
and I just went too far. Can, can you please reverse the slide? Uh, that ecosystem uh, includes the HIPSI investigators themselves who are actually doing the experimental work, uh, the HIPSI standards committee which is creating these templates, the import uh, resource which is storing all the data, and fundamentally we see ourselves in a situation where CEDAR will interact with all of these groups in our, in our initial attempts to be able to investigate how metadata can work throughout this entire experimental uh, work this entire uh, metadata creation and the uh, ability to use those metadata to retrieve relevant studies from import. So, and I just, I love this clicker. So it, if we uh, look at the architecture that we're creating in CEDAR, basically we are in concerning ourselves with a number of, of, of issues. In the leftmost panel, you see the idea of creating metadata templates, just as the HIPSI Standards Working Group is doing. The idea is that those templates provide the basis by which we can have a whole library of resources, much like those that come from the Biosharing Initiative, that we can piece together in order to be able to describe what needs to be said about scientific experiments in biomedicine. The middle panel shows the idea that we can take those templates, merge them and mix them up, and use them as the basis for creating the metadata themselves. So investigators will fill in those templates and specify what needs to be indicated about each experiment. And then ultimately, we'll take those completed metadata templates and merge them with the experimental data and put them in the appropriate online repositories. So the, the uh, CEDAR technology will allow us to create the metadata and store the data and the metadata online, but we won't do just that. In the rightmost panel, you see the idea that we will actually archive the metadata that are created through the CEDAR uh, platform, and those uh, 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 metadata in our local repository will become the basis of doing a number of things that we think will make the metadata authoring task a lot easier. Basically, we'll be able to use that repository to look for patterns in the metadata and use those patterns to actually make the authoring task simpler. So our technology will make it easier to author the templates. It'll make it easier, we think, to compose the templates than to fill them out. And our repository will pro provide the basis by which we can learn about patterns in the metadata and that we can use those patterns to guide the entry of the information needed in order to uh, make the metadata for new experiments more complete and more useful. So the idea is we are working on a set of web-based interfaces where we can piece together this information, create templates like the one you see in this slide. We can see, for example, the title of a study and the description of the study and enumerations of well-defined terms that describe the kind of study and so on. And authors of metadata will be able to fill out the templates and like uh, currently happens in the CEDAR uh, situation, express exactly what needs to be specified about the experiment in the most expressive way possible. And those data then become uh, available uh, for search and for uh, creating the opportunities to use those metadata in for, in for, uh, and the data th themselves in further experiments. But the key thing is that the data that we are creating, the metadata that we are creating, uh, need to be as, as complete and expressive as possible. If we have information such as existing metadata in our repository, we have information such as templates that already exist in our repository, if we can go out to PubMed and get the abstracts of the articles that describe the experiments, we can actually use all of this information to make guesses about what needs to be specified as people, people author new metadata. And we believe that the predictive data entry that we anticipate through the CEDAR technology will make it easier to specify the metadata, may not make it much fun to create metadata, but we believe that there'll be great opportunities there. And I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so to conclude, um, what we anticipate in the next few months is increased work on this, on, on this infrastructure, which will enable us to be able to think about metadata, not as just something that a postdoc adds to a data set before it gets archived online, but a representation of information about uh, the experiment in a way where basically the metadata provide as much information as a publication ultimately might. We view our work as leading to a situation where scientific publication not only becomes a matter of putting prose into journals, but putting machine understandable representations online with the associated data sets. And we expect that with the kind of work that we're doing through our center, we'll be able to increase the usefulness of, of metadata, we'll be able to make the uh, 
metadata represent enough information that scientists should be able to replicate their experiments and ultimately hope that the scientific method itself can be improved. Thanks. <laughs>